Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for joining us today in our weekly webinar series. Today, our feature topic is an introduction to data centers. My name is Jessica Petrohoy, and I'm the marketing coordinator at fiberoptic.com. Fiberoptic.com is a leading provider of fiber optic products, training, and rental equipment. We're pleased to present this topic to you today. So with us today to talk about introduction to data centers is Adam Goth. Adam is a technical engineer of sales and services for fiberoptic.com. He'll be discussing a brief history of data centers and how they are used today. When Adam is finished, we'll take questions from the GoToWebinar question box at the bottom of the screen for a question and answer session. And remember, our webinars are posted online at fiberoptic.com slash webinar. So thank you again for joining us today. And at this time, I turn the presentation over to Adam. Thank you very much, Jess, for that introduction. Um, I really appreciate that. I welcome everyone and uh, thank you for joining us this afternoon on our regular Bat Time, Bat Channel webinar Wednesday, uh, every uh, three o'clock each Wednesday. We always have our webinars and it's free informational training um, provided by the Fiber School professional, technical, and training. And uh, as Jess said today, we are going to go over an introduction to data centers. And uh, it's, it's truly, we're kind of giving you a uh, snapshot or a quick nutshell um, of 60 years of data centers from the growth, the birth, and uh, how it's changed over the years. So, you know, really want to welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us today. And we are going to move on and move on to our next slide and agenda um, and go simply over what, what we're looking at today. So the agenda is going to go over the definition, which is the breakdown of a data center. We're going to go over the history of the data center. We're going to actually go, you know, through decade through decade, you know, the birth, the growth, the advancement, you know, going over the history of the data center. And, and some say, you know, it, it the uh, even though the data center is truly, you know, over six decades old, 60 years old, it's truly, some say, in, their, in its infancy. Uh, so it, it's interesting how it's been changing and growing. And uh, then we're really going to get into how data centers are actually used today, how they're utilized. Um, we're going to wrap it up with the summary, then go over everything again in a little more detail uh, as we wrap it up. And what I do encourage at, at the end is questions. Um, you know, if you would, please save the questions for the end. Uh, I, I really encourage it. I'm happy to uh, go over uh, the ins and the outs of uh, those questions and answer them to the best of my ability. If I can't get the answer for whatever reason, um, you know, I will get the answer for you and I'll be able to get that to you either by phone or by email, whatever's, uh, whatever is convenient for yourself. So now that we've gone over the agenda, um, an introduction to the data centers, uh, we are going to move on to the actual definition. So what is a data center? As per Google, it's a large group of networked computers typically used by organizations for the remote storage, processing, or distribution of large amounts of data. You know, in reality, if you happen to have a data center as local as in within your home, technically you have a remote storage installed in your home network. You know, you really truly have a data center at home. Um, a lot of people do this nowadays. A lot of people actually have, you know, that data center at home. Um, typically, a data center is a remote facility used to house computer systems and components for such things as telecommunications, telecom, or for off-site storage. So that's what Google's true definition of a data center is. And uh, it's a large group, network computers typically used for organizations for remote storage, processing, distribution of large amounts of data. 
Now we're really, this is where things, this is kind of the birth of data centers, if you will. It's funny because data centers truly um, were not utilized or designed even for what we're using them for today. Um, in the beginning, uh, if you happen to, you know, look at the slide here, you have ENIAC. Um, ENIAC was what uh, the gentleman uh, Jesper S. Ecker and John McCauley actually started out um, the electronic numeric integrator and computing was invented by Presper Eckert and John McCauley. It was built here at the University of Pennsylvania, which is actually where our, our corporate headquarters is located in Pennsylvania also, um, and it was in 1946. The invention of this first all-purpose digital computer signaled the birth of the information age. So, you know, kind of getting into the history of the data centers here, um, you know, it just kind of uh, gives a breakdown of, of what we're really looking at and, and how it started out. So, it was actually in 46, it was the U.S. Army at the University of Penn um, what they happened to do is uh, they were using actually their data center, um, which was absolutely massive, much the largest in, in 46 compared to, you know, what we see now, nowadays. It was a whopping 700, 1,700 square feet. Um, it was absolutely mammoth. It was massive. And to cool and to operate this, um, ENIAC when it was designed at the time, it was state of the art, but, but you know, nowadays with everything that we have, it would be impossible to use. Um, the U.S. Army actually designed ENIAC to store it, uh, artillery firing codes. So this was used for the Army and for firing codes, and that's what it originally started as. So uh, the birth of data centers, um, it's just kind of funny how the they are used today is much different for what they are used in uh, uh, in current you know times and, and in today and you can see from the picture there it's pretty unique all right now we're going to start that was the birth that was 46 we're going now into the history of the 50s um, later on in the early 50s there was tradiac which is transistor digital computer, Tradiac, that's what that happens to stand for. Um, thanks to AT&T Bell Labs, we now have a fully transistorized computer. As you can see here in the photo, the footprint was certainly improved upon. This was the first commercial application concept that became popular in the 60s and uh, in 70s and so forth. And how the A the mentioned American Airlines was able to build its data center. Although mainframes were available, they were usually built for government and military at a cost of about $3 million per. So what uh, Bell Labs really did is, is they helped to kind of uh, springboard, um, you know, the advanced compact Tridiac. Jumping into the 70s, from this point on, things starting to pick up quite a bit as far as technology goes on a speed in which it hit the mainstream. So this is where we're really going to start. Xerox kind of uh, jumped to the forefront here um, with their Intel processor, you know, the Xerox Alto, and uh, as they say, the beloved ArcNet um, with uh, Blow Center here. Um, in 1971, the first programmable processor was available. This allowed companies to purchase a process and program in the company's needs. In 73, Xerox jumped into the game and first dubbed uh, PC dubbed the Xerox Alto. In 77, we saw our very first LAN, LAN network, local area network, called ArcNet which is, uh, as, as stated in the slide below there. It was put in the service for Chase Manhattan Bank, and the network supported a whopping 255 PCs and had a transmission rate of 2.5 megabits. 
it's kind of funny today um, compared to today's speeds we're looking at about a hundred megabits um, which is something that's just interesting and this was cutting edge back in the day so but in the 70s it was truly cutting edge in 1978 a company called SunGuard develops a business of commercial disaster recovery this is really uh, when we kind of started to turn the corner here and then get into the 80s but this helped alleviate the headache that was the mass undertaking of dealing with the mainframes all of the backups the installs the recovery prior to this the idea of updating anything software hardware etc was such a process due to the fact that everything was contained on the same machine any update would consist consist of taking down the entire network which in today's day and age would just be unacceptable um, and business for the duration of those updates so back then to go ahead and do that you would literally have to shut down a network and imagine all the employees that wouldn't be working um, business would really come to a halt all right now we're going to start jumping into the history of the 80s and uh, that's when things really kind of start moving uh, faster forward uh, with the growth the 80s were historical to the computer re revelation not only due to the fact that the introduction of the personal computer caused the boom in the microcomputer industry but the development of the network file system protocol allowed a client PC to access files across a network similar to how local file or files are accessed this uh, system was developed by IBM again um, you're going to hear IBM's name mentioned quite a few times um, throughout uh, um, our presentation today um, and it's I mean with them working back in the day with uh, IBM and uh, American Airlines working together um, you know it, it's something that uh, they're just kind of one of the front runners always have been when it comes down to uh, data centers and, and computers that we're all aware of um, so now we're going to move on history starting to jump into the 90s with the 1990s rolling at a feverish pace we start seeing that what is now known as data centers being formed the old mainframes that had been used all these years were finding themselves replaced by microcomputers microcomputers were being used as a server and filling the rooms that housed the mainframes companies began assembling these server rooms within their own walls now looking at the mid 1990s 94 95 96 really started to see a jump as we witnessed a huge surge known as the dot-com error um, godaddy.com really really kind of benefited from this um, this surge is uh, growth caused companies to want faster internet speeds non-stop operation um, this want and need led to the creation of more server rooms leading to much larger facilities now hundreds of thousands of servers the data center as a service model became popular at this time so what we're familiar with today is very similar to what began in the mid 1990s all right leading into the tail end of the 90s uh, Apple is now starting to break onto the game and uh, really make an impact um, they created software called the virtual PC which allowed Mac users to run a copy of Windows on top of the Mac OS this was done as a workaround to be the incompatibilities between the two operating systems virtual PC as well as the VM where a little later at the end of the 90s showed that we can not only create a virtual environment on the local PC but we can now create a virtual machine at the remote site and access from the office um, you know so no compatibility that's not a problem whatsoever uh, something that our current data centers can handle all right so now we're getting into uh, you know 
our, our current day and age, 2000, less than uh, a decade away. Uh, as, exci as exciting as the past de uh, couple decades have been to the computer world, uh, there's always more. Um, newer, bigger, better, faster. In 2001, we have the ability to run a bare metal hypervisor that runs directly over the server hardware without the need for an underlying operating system. Because of the direct access to the hardware, bare metal hypervisors featured high availability and resource management. They also provide better performance, scalability, and stability, which is something that is so important in today's day and age. Um, the better performance, the scalability, the true size of what you're looking at, and the stability. If you remember back in 1946 when ENIAC was really what started out, uh, we were looking at 1,700 square feet. I mean, it, it was it was truly massive and, and mammoth. And and now going forward, you know, we the scalability we've dialed back on size, and uh, now we're going to start getting into uh, the cloud and, and present day. Uh, look at that. You know, the cloud right right around the corner, and this is when Amazon um, really, really kind of broke into the game, and that's 2002. Uh, the Amazon cloud is born. Um, they were the front runner and, and one of the most notable. Um, they started to provide services to start to develop a bundle of services that included storage as well as computation that we now call the cloud services. So in 2006, that's when Amazon really started to offer actual IT infrastructure services for businesses and business owners. Cloud computing is born. All right, so now we're at the history of 2007, so we're less than a decade away. This is when Sun Microsystems broke into the game. This is where um, some of these companies have really started to make their bread and butter. Um, the portable black box, it's, it's something that they, uh, they beat their chest about and they are very pr proud about. Um, Sun Microsystems introduced this modular set uh, data center. They called it Project Black Box. And what it did is it transformed the fundamental economics of corporate computing. So if you had a system go down, your data centers went down, you needed additional storage. This could be taken on a flatbed, driven to your facility, um, placed in the backyard of your building, hooked up, and it is up and running and ready to go. They have their own racks. They have their own cooling systems. It's something that is a quick, easy fix. Um, you know, in many cases, companies grew out of their existing space. They did not have enough space. There was not enough uh, room for them and their data centers. And so to add more power and cooling systems and existing data centers without causing a physical meltdown, this was where Sun Microsoft really portable black box came onto the field. Um, and that's what they still use today. It's a portable data center with pre-configured server racks able to host the majority of the time's needs. So this is just 2007, and this is something that you know we're still seeing today. Next, we're going to be coming up onto uh, Facebook and how they really started to have a major impact in the field, and that's because of their open com project. This is something that they're very proud of. This is something that uh, all Facebook data centers are 100% OCP. So this is kind of like their regu regulation. Facebook is the one, the front runner that you always hear um, when this is brought up, but they actually got together with uh, a couple other uh, big, big companies and that's where, you know, Open Commute Project came. And this is where they needed uh, common practices to be launched within the industry. So there's an industry-wide initiative to share the same specifications, same practices, same regulations to create the most cost-effective, energy-efficient, and economical data centers. Um, so they're, you know, they're one of the front runners. They're very proud of it. What it is is to help companies not only go green, but 
they're truly saving money. Um, so it, it's something that's extremely nice and um, something that uh, you know Facebook is proud of. Um, the Open Commute Project's mission is truly to design and enable the delivery of the most efficient server storage and data center hardware designs for scalable computing. You know, we believe openly sharing ideas, specifications, and other intellectual property is the key to maximizing innovation and reducing operational complexity in the scalable uh, computing space. So all of their data centers, uh, even one here in Altoona, Pennsylvania, uh, they're all 100% OCP, and it's something that, you know, they're proud of, and, and you know, they, they want to have regulated, you know, uh, not just for themselves, but for everybody out there, um, you know, using data centers. So now we're at 2013. Um, just wanted to warn some of our webinar uh, attendees today that... Um, our webinars usually run about an hour. Today we're going to be closer to about a half an hour to 40 minutes, so there will be plenty of time for uh, questions at the end. But getting into the history 2013, uh, Telcordia's generic requirements for telecom data centers. Um, what they did is they introduced generic requirements for telecom data centers to equipment and spaces. So what this did is this was for cooling, um, electric usage, uh, prevention of meltdowns, um, also backing up things, uh, you know, batteries, things of that nature. They just kind of a generic set of requirements uh, for the telecommunication data. Uh, the document presents minimal spatial and environmental requirements for data center equipment spaces. Um, Here's a side note just to show you how important this truly is uh, with data centers. Google themselves in 2013 invested a massive $7.35 billion. That's $7.35 billion into its internet, uh, internet infrastructure um, just because they knew that you know the expansion of the global data center network that they were working with was you know was was very very vital to their company and to the development. Um, this at the time represented the largest construction effort in the history of da the data center industry. So uh, just that number alone, 7.35 billion dollars is 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 a massive amount, um, and it just shows how much they really you know believe in, in data centers and their infrastructure. Um, now we're going to get on to how data centers actually are used today. Um, data centers have several uses. The three main that we're going to discuss today are telecommunications, telecom, um, data storage, and of course the almighty web. Um, telecom industry um, uses them heavily. The telecom com, uh, companies have recognized that the growth in our network society have proven demands for data centers and services show no signs of slowing down. Um, and that's definitely true today um, from our cell phone use to our uh, need for our wireless, whether it's your tablets or even from uh, wireless with our, our cars today. Um, you know, it, it's something that's extremely important and uh, is used on a regular day basis by every single person, regardless of age, uh, multiple times on a daily basis. Um, it's almost a bit of a war going on for land to accommodate the need of space for data centers between big telecom companies and existing companies that offer data center services such as Amazon and uh, Microsoft, as you can see right there. Although Telcom has been trying to compete with the big businesses of existing data center companies, they are finding harder than expected, um, and companies such as Verizon are rumored to be looking into selling off their data centers, such as Windstream has already done so. There are almost too many companies to list that offer data storage as a service. Some of the larger companies like Microsoft with Azure, Amazon, and Google are just a few, and they are the mainstream monsters. 
but a few really have a large market share. Companies, big and small, practice good IT and use this data storage to house off-site data like backups and digital documents. As for web services, again, we have some of larger ones like Microsoft and Amazon Web Services offering affordable solutions to companies' needs. Companies are really taking on to the idea of cloud-based computing. Now cloud-based is extremely popular. Our things are going to change in the future. It's possible, but cloud-based is, is what is used mostly right now and, and will be seen as the future. Just about anything that can be done with the company's walls can be done in the cloud. Anything from hosting company's phone system to having several virtual environments to host the software needed by the company without a huge investment, that is what it takes to purchase all the hardware and the software. All right, so now we're coming down to the tail end of uh, our presentation. Um, so we're going to summarize and wrap up the 60 years of history uh, that we went over with data centers and how, how from going from ENIAC on 1946 to present day. Um, I'm going to go over some personal experiences also dealing with some of the areas that uh, we've dealt with data centers um, because with uh, fiberoptic.com and, and um, our company here, um, we we've worked with uh, with data centers before, and and you know I've had a few personal experiences. So you know as we've seen throughout this presentation, the idea of data centers didn't really start the way we thought it would start out. Um, back with the U.S. Army back at uh, University of Pennsylvania, but you know it started from having the idea of a way that everyone within a company and across the globe can access the same data at the same time. American Art Airlines partnered with IBM. From there, the data center as we know it today has evolved into what we know it as today due to the ingenuity of people that had specific needs as well as companies that saw a growing need to house our data, provide ex expensive service space at an affordable rate, as well as offer services to companies that would help the company to grow. Data centers are still evolving, and some say they're you know, still truly in their infancy, and helping shape how we do business across the vast world wide web. We have built these data centers based on the idea that sprouted up over 60 years ago, six decades, and who knows what the next 60 years are going to bring. But I do hope that the growth in technology continues the way it has, which I, I truly believe. Um, it's interesting, you know, from small little hub houses to, uh, you know, to larger data centers, um, it's always the, the cost of trying to get more in a smaller spot and to maintain at a lower cost for, you know, electricity and cooling and, and things of that nature. Um, so that, those are always going to be the issues that we have um, because they're not making any more land. We have what we have. So what we have to do is find ways to uh, utilize and, and advance our data centers at you know, uh, uh, an environmentally sound and, and economical rate. So I'm looking for uh, some questions here from, from people out there in the field. Uh, I do see a few. Um, one of the questions that I see here, and if you have any more, you know, feel free to reach out to myself at uh, adam.goth at fiberoptic.com or uh, anyone, you know, at uh, training at fiberoptic.com. Uh, any of the members of the staff would be happy to uh, help you out and get back to you. Um, Question I happen to have here is, uh, you know, um, do you really feel that, you know, data centers are, are going to be going the way of the cloud uh, in today's day and age? You know, do you feel that it's going to be that way in the future? Right now, yes. You know, I, I feel that uh, the cloud is, 
is here today and I don't feel that it's going to be going anywhere anytime soon. Um, you know, I think it's something that, uh, you know, is utilized uh, on a regular basis. Um, someone asked, do you feel that, you know, uh, the energy and the cooling systems we're using today, it, it, are we going to, is it going to be the same in the future? And um, I know that 10 years ago, um, you know, one of the VP of data center, uh, Jack Black, said that 10 years ago the average power draw per cabinet was probably 700 to 800 watts. Five, five years ago it was at 1.5 kilowatts and uh, now 3 kW. And if we continue on this trend, uh, we're going to see a 5 or 6 kilowatt level. Um, and that's the average power draw of about five years ago. So I think what Facebook is doing and, and how they're, they're going forward, um, that's, I mean, almost quadrupling the use of electricity that, you know, was from five years ago. That's, that's kind of astronomical. So something's going to need to be done. And what Facebook's doing going forward um, is, is one of the best ways that, you know, we're trying to maintain that because data centers where there's always going to be um, that much more of a need for them because of all the information, uh, the data storage and, and, you know, the computation for companies. So that is a good question, you know, we, and, and that's something that, that uh, is being worked on. But yeah, the, with the uh, more data usage, uh, each day, there's, you know, the cost is always going up and, and the need for electricity is going up. So that was a good question. Um, I think I am going to wrap up our presentation. Uh, if you do have any other questions, like I said, uh, feel free to reach out at training at fiberoptic.com or myself at Adam Goff uh, at fiberoptic.com. I uh, really appreciate everybody attending us this afternoon and uh, look forward to working with you guys and talking with you next webinar Wednesday at 3 o'clock. Uh, look forward to talking with everyone again. Take care.